as we speak, just 14% of England's rivers are in good ecological condition. And government's latest projections issued just before last Christmas is that unless there is a serious intervention by 2027, that number will have dropped to 6%. We have basically been destroying every single river in the country. Fergal, we're here in the magnificent surroundings of <laughs> Amwal Bangor. The Amwal Magnificery. And we're here, of course, to discuss the plight of yeah. Britain's rivers. You, as probably now one of the lead campaigners on this issue, uh, people might not automatically recognise or expect <laughs> you to be carrying that badge. Uh, they might know you for, shall we say, different reasons. And that makes two of us. Is, uh, I didn't want to pick this fight and I had no intention of picking this fight. I kind of feel it was thrust upon me. You had a moment this week where you were in a shop. Yeah. Something happened which might have brought home your new status to you. What happened? Uh, there was a very lo wonderful, lovely lady behind the counter um, with a look of puzzlement and questioning in her eyes and a look I've seen an awful lot over the last 40 years of my life. And she uttered those immortal words, are you that environmentalist bloke? And at which point my brain just went, Oh my God, that's a new one. That's the first time that's ever happened. Sharky, that's it. Your music career's over. You're done. You're dusted. It's time to retire. Walk away. That I've now become this environmentalist. Little did I know. How does that feel? And explain to us just a little bit about your connection with, um, with rivers. Um, for me, there was two kind of parallel rail tracks running in my life that I didn't really understand as a child. One, uh, I found myself in the clutches of the Christian Brothers where they had a very simple idea that you were going to have an education whether you liked the idea or not. And if you choose not to cooperate, they had a number of ways and means to offer you some enthusiasm to cooperate with the system. One of which was that you had to pick and indulge and get traction with and get involved in a long, long list of after-school clubs, activities. I ticked the box marked Gaelic football. I ticked the box marked hurling. And for some unknown reason, I also ticked two boxes, one marked fly fishing and the other marked fly tying. And here I am sitting on the banks of the Elmo Magna. At first blush, beautiful place, yeah. a tranquil spot. Yeah. But if not here, not very far away, there's big trouble, isn't there? What, what, what is, in a nutshell, the issue with our rivers? Um, what sort of state are they in? Well, the simple trip, well, the easy answer to that one, uh, as we speak, just 14% of England's rivers are in good ecological condition. And government's latest projections issued just before last Christmas is that unless there is a serious intervention by 2027, that number will have dropped to 6%. Now here's the thing. 20 years ago, this year, we passed a law saying that by 2027, 100% of rivers, ponds and lakes in England, in the UK, would be in good ecological status. Healthy bird populations, insect populations, wide diverse populations of fish, and yet here we are, the latest projection is, that will be 6% by 2027 on a massive downward trajectory. We have basically been destroying every single river in the country. There's a lot of debate, and we'll go into this, about who is to blame. Sure. Water companies, regulators. Yep. I wanted to start actually with the regulators. Actually, I mean, it's probably a little known fact that you have in your previous lives. This regulation? <laughs> exactly. Well, you've been a regulator. You know this, 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 this uh, world <laughs> inside out. Um, and there are a lot of questions. You yourself have been one of those raising these very strongly about the effectiveness, dare I say it, the, the, the competence yep. of organisations. Yeah like the Environment Agency and off what there are two yeah. waterway regulators. There is. Is it, is it time to cut our losses, merge this lot, disband them and, and create some sort of new watchdog, this time one with teeth? Uh, well, it, it, both these watchdogs have got lots of teeth. The law is there. Whoever put all this legislation together in the late 1980s, early 90s, actually knew that there may be problems. So all of the legislation is there. All of the teeth are there. It is quite simply the regulars have never been willing, able or desired or had the ambition to bite and bite hard. And systematically there has been a colossal failure of regulation throughout the whole industry, 
throughout both sectors, it's quite clear that Offwatch saw their obligation as simply driving down the price of water to the consumer, regardless of the environmental impact. The environment agencies whose job was to ensure that that wouldn't happen, environment would not pay the cost of cheap water. But of course, the environment agency has colossally failed in its job and its obligations as well. So for me, it's a classic case of uh, mutually assured destruction. Why do we want to keep repeating the same failed system that we've been doing for 30 years? It's over. It's finished. We do need to examine every nut and bolt of the regulatory system. And if that means restructuring the whole system, restructuring the whole industry, then that's what's going to have to happen. The Environment Agency has a testing budget. What's happened to that? Where is their testing regime? <laughs> Forgive me <laughs> for belly laughing. Um, on one level, was the, uh, as a matter of dogma, was the Environment Agency's budget culled over the last 12 years? Yes, it was. Uh, particularly in 2015. Uh, as you know, government's funding cycle works in five yearly cycle. So 2010, it got a budget cut, but that was the age of austerity. Everybody got their budget cut. That's OK. We'll go along with that one. In 2015, the bit of the budget that looks at monitoring water quality, testing, enforcement, taking people to court, prosecuting them, that part of that budget alone got cut by 57%. Now, you simply cannot cut any organization's budget by 57% and not willfully and blatantly set out to cripple it if not decapitated. In fact, the then Secretary of State bragged to Parliament, the footage is out there, that she had cut farm inspections that year by 34,000 and cut farming red tape by 80%. It was a classic free market dogma ideologist Frederick von Mayek, Chicago School of Economics, regulations distort the operation of free markets. We need to get rid of regulations completely even if that means burning it all to the ground. And what about the water companies? You know, I think a lot of people will see them as the villains. Yeah. With probably a good degree of justification. Um, you've certainly got them worried. <laughs> Every time you pop up, there's a response on their, on their behalf from, from one or the other. And they, you know, they, they're, they're trying to tell their story as they see it. They say they're putting in the investment. 56 billion pounds on England's <laughs> rivers. Where for you have they failed and are they failing? You see, there's where strategically the industry fail right there. And let me just clarify a couple of points. One, water industry, water companies invest little of anything. Any money they spend is funded directly out of bill payers' pockets. And secondly, let's talk about that 56 billion turns out that that's actually spread over the next 28 years. So when you break that down, that's what, 2.2 billion a year, roughly, loosely. Turns out that's spread across nine sewage companies. So you're actually looking at about 230 million pounds a year. Turns out I'm told that they've included everything in that number, including the tea bags for the crew that turn up and look after the uh, sewage station, the electricity bill for maintaining the pumps. And the truth is, if you actually get down to a figure looking more like 50, 60 million, you're probably closer to the truth. Now tell me again about the job they're doing. The truth is, because of the failure of political oversight, because of the completely incompetence of the regulators, that created a massive vacuum and an opportunity, and the water companies have exploited that opportunity, and their shareholders have benefited to the tune of about 72 billion pounds, while leaving those companies now saddled with just over £60 billion pounds worth of debt. Bearing in mind, we privatised those companies completely debt-free. We've been had. As I understand it, in Britain, we actually pay pretty low water bills. Mm -hmm. I suppose some might say that's the benefit of privatisation. But isn't there a, a, a truth here, if we are to deal with this issue, properly and permanently that actually we're gonna we as as bill payers are going to need to pay a bit more well there's two sides to this that you need to look at uh off what the economic regulator a year ago did now write to the water companies telling them that in the regulator's opinion water companies have been paid 
and provided with all of the funding they ever needed for 30 years to fix and maintain the sewage system. Clearly they haven't spent it on the sewage system, which begs a question, well, whatever happened to money? Well, I think we can all guess what happened that. When you look at chief executives, one chief executive last year pulled down 5.9 million pound salary and bonus. Maybe that's where the money went that should be spent in the sewage system. It also raises a question, why are we being asked to pay for it a second time? We've already given the water companies the money. Maybe they should pay for it this time round. So as it transpires, it's the same underinvestment, the same failure of regulation. And as we speak, London is now number nine on a list of 10 cities in the world most likely to run out of drinking water. London is now right up there with Cape Town, Jakarta, Sao Paulo and Mexico City. So the truth is, if we now want to secure London's water supply and prevent you having to cure a standpipe with a plastic bucket, somebody's now going to have to start spending huge amounts of money that the water industry has not been spending over the last 30 years. Otherwise, 25 million people are going to run out of water. I mean, as we sit here today, we can hear the aircraft going overhead. Yep. You, you know, we're never that far from, how can we put this, you know, humanity's fairly heavy footprint. Oh, not, listen, not in the least. And uh, yes, on one level, the earliest reference I can find was a hydrologist by the name of Walters back in 1963, warning the government, mm. and I'm quoting, that the chalk aquifer around London had been pumped almost to extinction. So people knew in the early 1960s what the trajectory was, what was going on. Do we in the, the uh, England in general have to have a think about our relationship with water? Turns out where you're sitting in Hertfordshire, uh, the good people in Hertfordshire are amongst the highest consumers of water on a daily basis than the whole of Western Europe. Now I think from recollection in Hertfordshire it's about 143 litres per person per day. When you get over to the Baltic states, uh, Estonia, for example, think in the mid-high 80s. When you go to the Germany and the S Scandinavian states, think kind of the 90s, possibly maybe touching on 100. We use, in general terms, pretty much 40% more times much water per day than most people throughout the world, rest of Europe. And we're going to have to change that idea because yeah, so it is utterly unsustainable. Yes, so there is an argument that there's, there's agency for us as ordinary oh. people to change our habits as well. They, oh, well, listen, we're going to have to. Could government f help fix this by simply changing the building regulations and making it mandatory that every new house built would have to use no more than 100 litres of water per day? Yes, they could. Mm. They've chosen that to. Could every local authority do the same thing through the planning system? Yes, they could. But they've chosen not to. Should we, as consumers, be provided with free water butts to go and collect and harvest all of that rain? Yes, we should. So the simple truth is, we just need somebody in charge. There's one word lacking from this whole conversation. Leadership. There isn't any. And how is it? We don't know how much sewage is going <laughs> into our rivers. By <laughs> how is this possible? Should, surely it must be that the water companies should be forced to gather and publish this. There this is, um, now bear in mind again, we go back to this kind of lack of transparency in government. Because government will tell you right now, look at a fantastic job we're doing. We're putting all these monitors in. What they forget to mention is they're putting all those monitors in directly as a result of the European Commission taking the UK government to the European Court of Justice in 2012, where the Court of Justice found the UK guilty of breaching the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive by allowing water companies to dump sewage into our rivers. So those monitors only exist because of a court case. And cleverly enough, I suspect there was any amount of lobbying on behalf of the water industry, because they loathe the idea of volmic metering. All we can tell right now is we were dumping sewage, it went on for an hour, but you're right. Was that a bath full or was that 69 swimming pools full? So the only one that I'm aware of that has volmic meter on it is actually the Mugden Sewage Treatment Works. And I suspect Thames Water regret it because that's the one that flagged up a year ago over two days. They dumped over two billion litres of sewage into the River Thames over the course of 48 hours. Maybe that's why they don't like the idea of volumic metering. Fogel, I wonder how angry this sometimes makes you. I mean, there was, there was an incident last year where an Indian politician 
took it upon himself to take a glass of water from uh, a river, um, a sacred river as it, it turned out, to prove its cleanliness in an act of bravado. Reportedly, he then spent the next three days in hospital with uh, a terrible stomach upset. I just wondered if there's a part of you that thinks, well, wouldn't it be a good idea if we could get water company chief executives, regulators, the politicians who deal with our rivers to perhaps do something similar? Take a glass of um, uh, water from a river of our choice and, um, and see what happens. Southern Water, at one point, probably about six or seven months ago, suddenly declared that, well, what's, every, what's everybody worrying about? Uh, the stuff we dump into the environment is 95% water. Good. If it's 95% water, and I did challenge the chief executive of Southern Water, and my challenge still stands. If he agrees to come and drink a glass out of that 95% water, out of a sewage overflow of my choosing, I will happily donate a thousand pound of my money to a charity of his choosing. For some reason, he's not felt the need to reply back to me about that idea. Let me remind everyone, this is part of the game that's now been played, and it's where I think the water industry itself is also lacking leadership and I probably shouldn't be saying this it's very easy for people like me to come back and go well truth is according to the uh, National Institute of Medicine in North America faeces is up to 92% water nobody's ever going to suggest I make my tea with it or we should all start bathing in it this weekend if you're going to pick an argument make it a bit better than that one you've been very forthright um, uh characteristically so in highlighting this issue of, of accountability yeah. and, and, and uh, as you see it, lack of, lack of leadership. Um, uh, I mean, do you, do you feel you now have to carry this burden until the job is done of knocking heads together um, um, uh, until you know, maybe you can finally come back to just get on with a bit of fishing? All I actually want back from my initial conversations is an equally honest, upright and joined up response to my queries. That didn't happen, so here's where we are. Now, from my perspective, people including government and water companies were given a choice. They chose another path, and I really don't mind, because we're going to end up where I want to be by the end of all of this. They chose one way, we could have gone the other. Now, am I going to stop before this is over? Absolutely not. I don't stop. Is there a part of you which nonetheless slightly longs for the time when you'll go into a shop and someone will oh. once more say, you're Fergal Shockey, that uh, pop star. Yeah, you're right. The last couple of years, people want to talk to me about shite and rivers. And guess what? I'm really looking forward to the day that I can go back to talking about music. Fergal Shockey, thank you very much. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you for the time.